Testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Good morning, one, two, three, four, five, six. Good morning, one, two, three, four. I want to get this last thing off the screen. Testing one, two, three. Testing, testing, testing. One, two, three, four. Continuing to go through to get the last thing off the screen because the last words on there were a bad word. Yeah, it does.
committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. I recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Good morning and welcome to today's full committee hearing, examining fire weather prediction tools and capacities. Today's discussion will help us assess the collaboration and coordination between the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration and other federal departments and agencies and state and local officials to ensure the safety of people and property. Today's hearing is timely as we enter the summer months, which have traditionally marked the beginning of wildfire season. However, I'm sure many of my Western colleagues would agree there's not much of a true wildfire season anymore. They seem to occur year round. In 2022 alone, the National Interagency Fire Center reported almost 69,000 fires that burned seven and a half million acres of land in the United States. Over the past month, the United States has had some of the worst air quality numbers in the world due to smoke from Canadian wildfires. By advancing our weather capacities, we have a chance to limit the size and scope of future fires, as well as improve research into air quality changes that come with fires. Lengthier droughts, hotter temperatures, and poorly maintained federal lands are all contributing to a greater frequency and intensity of wildfires across the country and around the world. There is no silver bullet to completely prevent fires, but we can make significant progress in protecting our communities if we improve the forecasting and prediction of weather conditions that lead to fires. Our witnesses today are involved with state emergency management, commercial sector innovation, and academic research to enhance the sustainability and accuracy of fire weather information. Their testimony will inform our work on legislation to better prepare communities and regions facing the rapid spread of fires. Let me be clear. The objective of this hearing and any future legislation related to wildfires is not for the federal government to make decisions for people, but by providing state and local emergency managers the most accurate information possible the federal government will be able to give local community leaders and everyday citizens the knowledge and understanding they need to make their own decisions. NOAA and the National Weather Service cannot tackle this problem on their own. Long gone are the days of fire watchers sitting in towers with binoculars scanning for smoke. A robust partnership with the commercial sector is necessary to help boost our forecasting and prediction capacities. I look forward to hearing about the advancements that the commercial sector has made with new technologies, including unmanned aerial aircraft. These are the types of innovations that will inevitably save the lives of firefighters and other emergency officials. Today's hearing is important because it allows us to examine a wide range of sectors that partner with federal departments and agencies to utilize different types of fire weather data. Their input will help us ensure the direction and resources we provide NOAA end up benefiting most Americans and avoiding wasteful duplication. I thank our witnesses for sharing their expertise with us, and I look forward to a productive discussion. I now recognize the ranking member, the gentlewoman from California, for an opening statement. Well, good morning, and thank you, Chairman Lucas, for holding this really important hearing, and I want to thank the witnesses again for coming to share your expertise on this topic, which is of such importance to our country. Every year, wildlife, uh, wildfires take lives and cause billions of dollars in damage. Uh, perhaps most concerning is that the frequency and destructiveness of wildfires are increasing, increasing due to climate change. Now, I'm from California, and I see the impacts of wildfires on communities firsthand. Um, in 2020, Santa Clara County, where I'm from, uh, experienced the fourth largest wildfire in California state history. The SCU uh, Lightning Complex fire burned over 396,000 acres, destroyed 225 structures, damaged uh, further 26 stru uh, structures, and injured six people. And that's in addition to other very destructive uh, wildfires that resulted in deaths to uh, individuals. Now, thanks to brave emergency responders, these fires are dealt with. Uh, but despite the uh, critical role emergency responders and wildland firefighters play in protecting lives and property and the considerable danger they put themselves in in doing so, they're, 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 they're significantly under-resourced. Support for our firefighters is far from the only challenge when it comes to reducing risks from wildland fires. 
um, many agencies and organizations from local to federal levels play a role in mitigating and responding to wildfires, posing challenges for interagency coordination and efficient use of finite resources. At the federal level, while there is coordination when it comes to wildfire response, there are significant gaps in coordination when it comes to increasing scientific understanding, prediction, resilience, and communication for wildland fires. We can't just keep responding to disasters. We need to invest more in preventing them where we can. And that's why I'm reintroducing this week the National Wildland Fire Risk Reduction Program Act. This bill would strengthen the federal coordination of research and operational efforts across multiple federal science agencies and support a more efficient and effective whole of government response to reducing wildland fire risk. And I, I'm looking forward to working with our chairman to move a bipartisan package of wildland fire bills through the committee and hopefully on to the Congress itself. Some of the most important information for wildlife, uh, wildfire detection, mitigation, and emergency response comes from observational systems and predictive models. Now, we have mountains of data uh, currently collected from assets owned and operated across academic, private, and the public sector, but there are considerable gaps uh, in data, and there's also inadequate uh, coordination in dissemination of that data. Uh, for example, many data sets lack the desired spatial and temporal resolution for maximum utility in modeling applications. Wildfire forecasting models also need uh, to be improved to better predict wildfire ignition and behavior. Coupled uh, wildfire models, which integrate our best understanding of the physics of fire interactions between fire and weather, are promising tools for improving real-time predictions of fire behavior. I'm so pleased that Dr. Uh, Tohidi, uh, who is an expert in coupled fire weather modeling, is here from my own San Jose State in my district, and he is doing in impressive work uh, at the university about how uh, Congress can help support innovations in modeling, along with our other two excellent witnesses. The increasing threat of wildfires poses to our community and our brave firefighters on the flight lines uh, requires the nation to effectively understand and predict fires, manage our wildlands safely, and expeditiously respond to them. I very much look forward to our testimony. And just a note, uh, all of us are on multiple committees, and another committee is meeting at this very moment. So I'm going to take a brief recess to go to that committee, and I'll be right back. Uh, this is one of the most important things before this committee and before this Congress. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. Our first witness today is Dr. Sorry, Mr. Mark Goler. Mark is the State Forester and Director of the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Forest, Food and Forestry, Forestry Services Division. Uh, while earning a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture Forestry Management degree from Oklahoma State University, Mark began fighting wildfires with the U.S. Forestry Service in 1980 and has served as an incident commander on literally hundreds of multi-agency, uh, multi-jurisdictional fires. Our second witness is Mr. James Prevell, uh, founder and CEO of Greensight, a technology company that builds products uh, built on a common technology platform, applying robotics and AI to solve high-impact problems in agriculture, defense, and weather monitoring. And our third witness is Ali Tohidi, an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at San Jose State University and co-principal investigator at their Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center. His current uh, research is based on developing the next generation of operational wildfire weather behavior models. So now that I've slaughtered your last names, let's move on. I now recognize Dr. Uh, Mr. Goler for five minutes to present his testimony. Thank you, Chairman Lucas and Ranking Member Lofgren, members of the committee for inviting me to this hearing today and the opportunity to testify on behalf of Oklahoma Forestry Services and the National Association of State Foresters. I'm Mark Goler, State Forester, Chair of the Oklahoma, uh, Southern Group of State Foresters and member of the National Association of State Foresters Executive Committee. Nearly every state forester is required by their individual statutes to deliver wildland fire prevention, detection, suppression, and investigation. 
State foresters also support federal land management agencies nationwide through cooperative agreements to conduct wildland fire operations. My wildland firefighting career began in 1980, and I fought wildfires in 22 states. I currently qualified as a Type 1 incident commander and serve on both state and national incident management teams. These experiences, along with serving as a fire management chief for 13 years and now a state forester, I have an advanced understanding that the key to minimizing loss, loss of life and property depends on fire weather forecasting, early wildfire detection, wildfire preparedness, and response. Wildfire is common in Oklahoma. Prior to 2015, I would have an, on average one day's warning that the areas of the state would experience high to extreme fire danger. That changed in late 2015 when the National Weather Service officials approached our agency to inform us of their research and new findings related to impactful fire weather systems. Because of this relationship with the National Weather Service, my fire management staff now has from three to seven days to pre-position firefighting resources for response. Red flag warnings have transitioned from strictly meeting hot, dry, windy criteria to currently a threat index of where the probability of high impact wildfires will occur in the state. Early warning of where fire effective weather systems will intersect high severity wildland fuels also allows for focused fire prevention messaging and firefighter safety briefings. Firefighter and public safety is greatly enhanced through this improved situational awareness. Oklahoma's wildfire detection system traditionally is limited to our commercial timber lands in far eastern Oklahoma, and we have lost all of our fire towers and, and manned those and have gone strictly to uh, other means. New wildfires are now detected statewide by the National Weather Service's GO-16 and 17 satellites, and typically within quarter-mile accuracy. Often these emerging wildfires are detected before they're reported by the public to 911 dispatch centers. These advances in fire weather forecasting and wildfire detection by the National Weather Service during high to extreme fire danger has allowed state, federal, and local firefighting agencies to target aggressive initial attack in areas where wildfire would have the greatest potential and impact a loss of lives, values at risk, and natural resources. Another innovation employed in Oklahoma is to issue fire warnings utilizing an integrated warning team approach. This warning system involves the local National Weather Service forecast office detecting and communicating to partners the location of a potentially dangerous wildfire. Oklahoma Forestry Service is utilizing Wildfire Analyst, a commercially available modeling software to predict the potential spread from, wildfires, from the wildfire's ignition point. We contact the incident commander and local emergency managers to confirm the warning need and also to provide the relevant evacuation information. And finally, state emergency management broadcasts the fire warnings through the emergency alert system to, to a targeted area jointly identified by the National Weather Service and Oklahoma Forestry Services. While this seems pretty cumbersome, the fire, a fire warning was issued in just six minutes on a recent wildfire occurring in a heavily populated wildland urban interface area in the Oklahoma City metro. Oklahoma is the first state in the nation to utilize this system. Using our legacy process, it often required approximately 90 minutes to issue the fire warning. As an incident commander responsible for recommending evacuations in advance of an approaching wildfire, it's imperative that local, official, uh, local officials with evacuation responsibilities and the public are provided with the greatest advanced warning and most accurate evacuation information possible to minimize the loss of life. Oklahoma's fire warning system gives the time and decision space to facilitate an orderly, safe evacuation. These advances in Oklahoma and Texas would not be possible without the close relationship between the National Weather Service, forecast offices, Oklahoma Forestry Service, and Texas A&M Forest Service. The ability to utilize each other's resources is critical to success in providing for firefighter safety and minimizing the loss of life and property. This collaborative approach and technological advances in fire weather forecasting and detection can be easily applied to preparedness and response actions nationwide. In closing, I appreciate the committee holding this impact, important hearing to investigate how National Weather Service and other entities will impact future wildland fire preparedness and response nationally through improved and emerging technologies. I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. Thank you. We now turn to you, James, for your five minutes. Chairman Lucas, Ranking Member Lofgren, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting Greensight to testify today before the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology to discuss innovative products and services provided by the commercial sector. 
and how they can partner with the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration for the improvement of fire weather now casting and prediction. I'm James Peverell, co-founder and CEO of Greensight. At the outset, I'd like to mention that it is a very exciting time in the United States for new and innovative technologies, especially for drone technologies, robotics, and artificial intelligence. For both civil and defense applications, these systems are showing tremendous value, whether it's the unmanned drone conducting missions on the surface of Mars or military drones playing increased roles in our national security. These systems have a proven record for aiding government missions. Greensight is an innovative small business based in Boston, Massachusetts that specializes in exotic robotic systems for transformative business applications. We're focused on several different markets, including agriculture, weather, and defense. We have several product lines, all based on a common platform of USA-made hardware and software components that empower end users to solve their mission requirements. As it pertains to the mission of environmental prediction in today's hearing, Greensight is currently collaborating with the Air Force Weather Service and Defense Innovation Unit, using our WeatherHive system for prototype development. Greensight's WeatherHive is a unique sensing technology that uses swarms of nano-sized drones to directly measure atmospheric conditions. This system can sample up to 200 square miles per flight, generating a dense 3D cube of measurements. This technology was initially developed through a National Science Foundation funded SBIR grant and has now been selected by the US Air Force and Defense Innovation Unit for prototype development, contract, and potential procurement. This selection was made under the Peacetime Indications and Warning Global, Global Weather Sensing Commercial Solutions Opening. WeatherHive data shows promise to enable new breakthroughs in weather forecasting and climate science. Armed with data from WeatherHive, forecasting models may be able to much more accurately predict tornado formation, severe storm behavior, wildfire movement, and hurricane paths. It is a promising new tool against an increasingly common severe weather conditions that cause property damage, injuries, and deaths every year. For the specific mission of fire weather, NOAA would benefit from an enhanced mission focus to improve their detection and forecasting capabilities. As a commercial company, we feel we can assist NOAA with this mission by providing critical data that improves the accuracy and timeliness of information to inform the public and safeguard lives and property. Previously, our conversations with NOAA have been centered around other weather events such as tornadoes, but applications for fire weather are equally as beneficial, if not more. The unique aspects of fire events place a greater emphasis on remote sensing. Fires are inherently dangerous and often happen in remote areas that are difficult to reach. Using sensing technologies such as drone swarms will allow NOAA to continuously monitor and collect various forms of data in a safe and efficient manner. The data collected by the WeatherHive system can be streamed in real time and used for both now casting events and in forecasting prediction systems and models. The data that WeatherHive collects is also compatible with many existing analytical tools, so there will be minimal need to redevelop forecasting infrastructure to ingest these new types of data. By establishing research partnerships, NOAA would be able to harness the ingenuity of American industry. These partnerships can be mutually beneficial and lead to breakthroughs in technologies that improve our scientific understanding of fire weather. Likewise, the establishment and coordination of mechanisms for commercial data buys will allow NOAA to quickly ingest new sources of data to improve prediction of fire weather events. Greenside stands ready to assist and partner with NOAA to improve their mission requirements for both research and operations. Lastly, an issue that must be addressed when moving these types of techn innovative technologies into widespread operational use is complying with the associated regulatory framework. Historically, the Federal Aviation Administration has the regulatory authority to grant the use and restriction of drones in the United States. Utilizing novel and unique case use cases for drones means that the FAA needs to address potentially outdated federal regulations and look for creative solutions to allow for integration into both public and private missions. WeatherHive is designed to operate with minimal risk to aviators, people, and property while promising to offer significant overall benefits to public safety. I look forward to working with the FAA to ensure that our progress in these technologies is not limited so that we can continue to partner with the federal government to improve mission success. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and members of the committee, I thank you for the opportunity to testify to you before you today, and I would be pleased to answer any questions. Thank, thank you. you. I now recognize Dr. Tahiti for five minutes to present his testimony. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Lucas, uh, Ranking Member Lofgren, and other distinguished members uh, of this committee. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to appear as a witness in this hearing on a, a topic of growing importance to both nation and the world. We appreciate the committee's attention to wildfires and the efforts uh, you have undertaken over the last few years to invest in wildfire science. My name is Ali Tohidi, and I'm an Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering at San Jose State, and I'm also a co-principal -prin investigator of uh, Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center at San Jose State. My background is in fluid and fire dynamics, and my research and development efforts over the past 10 plus years have been dedicated 
to understanding the fundamentals of wildfire spread mechanisms, particularly a phenomenon called fire branch shower, also known as ember attack. In this testimony, I uh, present a concise overview of wildfire physics and modeling approaches and elaborate on some of the identified challenges by fire science community. Then I provide recommendations to overcome them. Wildfires are an important part of ecosystem globally. However, detrimental effects of the climate change, poor land management practices such as fire exclusion and continuous growth of the wildland urban interface, or as we call it, buoy areas, have transitioned wildfires regimes to extreme and high impact events leading to loss of lives, severe disturbances in biological systems and um, uh, biological systems and causing billions of dollars in damages. The impacts are projected to grow in severity and magnitude. Thus, we need our uh, communities to become more resilient to wildfires. A key component to achieve this is the ability to accurately estimate the potential progression of the fire uh, through the landscape and our communities. Fire models, uh, fire weather models fulfill this objective by simulating fire spread mechanisms and their secondary effects on the environment. Briefly, wildfires are spread by the progression of the fire front through heat transfer from flames and hot gases to unburnt combustibles and ignition of spot fires far ahead of the main fire front uh, by fire branch showers. While our fundamental understanding of some, uh, of some of these processes is improving and findings are partially implemented in models, it is still challenging to deliver a high fidelity forecast. This is due to the multi-physics, multi-scale, and stochastic nature of wildfires, leading to current knowledge gaps that are stated in, my deta in detail in my written testimony. From the operational fire weather modeling standpoint, the main cause of unreliable forecast is partly due to the oversimplification of the fire dynamics in models, uh, model formulations, and partly due to their design objectives. Most fire weather models, including their data layers, are designed to simulate wildfires in large spatiotemporal scales, tens of meters in space and hours in time. This may be appropriate for wildland fires in remote areas, but not for the current regime of fires uh, we experience at buoy zones, as fire dynamics occurs at flame scale, meters in space and seconds in time. To enhance the current state of fire weather models, we need to invest in the cross-disciplinary initiatives to design and deploy sensors and observe and measure wildfire behavior at flame scale with, with unsaturated, clean, and high-resolution data. Such continuous and high-resolution measurements nationwide can also serve as a reliable situational awareness platform for first responders. We need to invest in multi-scale laboratory infrastructures, controlled field campaigns, and rapid data collection teams nationwide to study wildfire dynamics at, again, flame scale. These measurements and observations are crucial for defining the canonical cases of wildfires and fire weather model development, validation, and verification. We need to invest in improving the quality, frequency, and resolution of the current data layers for uh, fire weather models, leveraging the advances in scientific machine learning and AI. We need to establish infrastructures to centralize, standardize, and integrate wildfire-related data sets and provide ac access to scientific community for model development. Support is needed for data collection efforts on the exposure of communities and infrastructures to wildfire risk, post-incident damages, and suppression activities and their effectiveness during events. These are key data sets for informing and calibrating the risk models, particularly in WUI zones. We must encourage and support community-driven and open-source wildfire model development that co-produces with the relevant stakeholders. Co-production is essential for success of our models as the definition of success differs from one stakeholder to the other. The need for rigorously validated, validated and reliable wildfire models is increasing and accurate estimation of fire behavior across the scales has invaluable benefits for communities and stakeholders. My view is that the key to developing high-performing models is the comprehensive application of fundamentals of fire behavior and safety sciences, leveraging insights from field and experimental observations at flame scale, along with efficient implementation of these findings with co-production in mind. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. I again thank the witnesses for all your testimony, and I recognize myself for uh, five minutes. Uh, Mark, from one Oki to another, uh, welcome to the nation's capital, and thank you for taking time to share our state's great work on this topic. I want to dig a little deeper on the value of collaboration and partnerships in the area of fire weather prediction. Your experience in Oklahoma and the development of the tools you mentioned in your testimony, uh, who are all needed to be at the table, including the federal, state, and local parties, 
How did this come together? It started out as a result of the 2005-2006 dormant fire season in Oklahoma where we had multiple wildfires impacting the state, not only Oklahoma but Texas and others in the southern Great Plains. As a result of that uh, episode that we had, there were a number of individuals that formed what was called the Southern Great Plains Wildfire Outbreak Group. That included, at the time, individuals from the Texas Forest Service, now Texas A&M Forest Service, Oklahoma Forestry Services, National Weather Service forecast offices out of Norman, Amarillo, Abilene, Midland, uh, and a number of others to start looking at that phenomena that we, that we experienced there in Oklahoma. And so as time went on, the, the partnership that developed between those offices, individuals, just continued to grow and really start to look into the, the weather dynamics of how that affected our fire fighting uh, response in, this, in those states. The, the missions between our agencies and the National Weather Service, they meet in the protect, in protection of life and property. And so the one thing with the National Weather Service is obviously they have the tools to look at the weather, weather patterns and so on and analyze such. We have the wherewithal to evaluate our wildland fuel conditions. And so the, the meeting of those two groups and agencies along with state and other local emergency managing, and management personnel is what formed that. And it was critical to be able to do that to put us to where we are today. One last question along that line. Can you share some of the lessons that you learned from other states who might be interested in developing similar tools for forests and communities? One of the things that the, the lesson learned uh, as traveling around the United States and working on fires, it's a little bit different when you're involved with an incident management team assigned to a fire in Montana, California, Oregon, wherever it is. We do have incident meteorologists through the, the IMET program with the National Weather Service that are assigned to the fire team, the incident command team. But, you know, the things that I would emphasize for lessons learned is for other state forestry agencies, local emergency management agencies to get to uh, really working closely with their National Weather Service forecast offices. Look at the model that we employ in Oklahoma. Look at the process that we went through. It's applicable anywhere in the United States. The same parameters that we have in Oklahoma would not necessarily work in other states, but the process would. And the research that went into what affects our weather systems would be absolutely employable in other places. And to my other two witnesses, uh, you know, it's not hyperbole to say that each of you conduct work that saves lives, directly saves lives, whether it's citizens in affected areas or firefighters. Could you briefly touch on how you engage both first responders and everyday communities to get their input on your products or research and ensure that what you offer is useful to both groups? Uh, well, part of when we developed WeatherHive, we engaged with a lot of end users. Actually, when we, we participated in the NSF SBIR program, part of that was engaging with a tremendous number of end users, uh, both first responders, public entities, um, as well as universities and other types of forecasting entities. And that was really part of the project from the outset. Uh, we really wanted to engage with users and make sure that the data that we were generating with the system would be very relevant for public applications and for weather forecasting applications. And the excitement that we saw during that process has really driven us to push even harder to get the technology into use with the public. And so that has been, it's been part of our engagement since the beginning. Absolutely. Doctor? Thank you for the question. Uh, this is exactly why we started the Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center at San Jose State University. And uh, part of the mission that we have is to include the stakeholders, know their problems uh, and what they are dealing with uh, in uh, uh, facing wildfires and try to address those questions. Uh, for example, CAL FIRE is also part of the center. Uh, and um, uh, we hear their problems and we try to uh, tailor the models such that it can address those uh, questions that they have. Uh, they want to know uh, where the fire is exactly and uh, what are the projections for the forecasts and we are trying to address those. Thank you. 
My time has expired. I now recognize the gentlelady from Oregon, Ms. Bonamici, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to all the witnesses for your, your expertise. I agree with the chairman that the work you do helps to save lives and property. Uh, the climate crisis is certainly contributing to making wildfires more dangerous and frequent, putting lives and property and the environment at risk. And in my home state of Oregon and the Pacific Northwest, we're expected to see longer term, hotter and drier weather, making our forests more vulnerable. Uh, accurate fire weather uh, and air quality forecasts are extremely important to our region, and I know NOAA uh, needs to be able to continue this work and improve it, especially coordinating with other federal and state agencies to support the rapid containment and suppression of wildfires. We're using some remote cameras right now, uh, increasingly using those. We have about 93 remote cameras now spread over 64 locations with a target of 110 cameras by the end of the year. In addition to digital fire outlook, some of the programs have various levels of artificial intelligence. For example, Portland General Electric is now investing more than $20 million in its wildfire mitigation and resiliency plan, and that includes high-definition AI cameras to detect wildfires across the region. So I wanna ask you, and I have a question for each of you, Mr. Peverell, as AI advances, how can we leverage the technology to better predict, locate, and battle fires? Uh, and how can we streamline and improve interagency coordination? Well, the types of data that we're generating with our system is really what we call now casting. Um, so instead of generating data that needs to be run through a lot of forecasting models, which takes time, uh, we're actually directly sampling the conditions. Um, which is very suited to use by artificial intelligence algorithms that would feed into first responders. Um, it's really about delivering the data rapidly um, that can be used immediately for, for, for first responder planning activities. Um, and I think directly uh, collaborating between companies like us that are generating data and agencies like NOAA and CAL FIRE that are, used, that are involved with fire control directly um, is really critical. That's great. And Dr. Tahiti, your work on modeling and the whole physics of, of fire is really interesting and, and I think important. Uh, how does your work intersect with what NOAA is doing? So NOAA does you know, the weather modeling and then you're doing the, the sort of physics and modeling of how the fire will progress. How does that intersect and how do you work together with NOAA on that? Thank you for the question. Um, we use a lot of data all the years uh, that uh, NOAA generates uh, to initialize our uh, fire, water, uh, fire weather models. And uh, those are gonna be used uh, to uh, set the initial conditions. And the models basically solve the conservation laws and uh, do the forecasts. Uh, we also use a, a variety of different data layers from other institutions such as US Forest uh, Service, uh, the fuel layers, uh, fuel moisture, um, and, um, and you know, some we have some static layers such as uh, terrain topography uh, uh, that we uh, we also use, uh, and that's uh, basically the relation uh, that we have in the capacity of uh, fire physics modeling. Thank you, thank you for your work. Uh, and, and Mr. Goler, I want to ask about the timing of warnings. And, and you mentioned in your testimony something about what you call innovative and probabilistic approach that results in earlier uh, warnings than the, the old red flag system. So, so after the wildfires caused some horrific damage in, in Oregon in 2020, in September of 2022, our state requested access to federal funds for wildfire response and preparation before the, the growth of the number of wildfires expanded beyond what the state could handle. Um, and you know, especially related to emergency declaration, I think this is important because that opens up these federal resources. So many fires were already burning, vital staff and resources were stretched thin, and the state was concerned that without the federal resources, they would not have what they needed to provide the emergency power generation, communications, evacuation support, et cetera. So based on your experience, how can improvements in wildfire prediction enhance the mitigation, but also prepare states with more adequate response efforts? And I'm really concerned about this timing because we did not get the emergency declaration. It's typically done after the fire happens, uh, not always, but after. Um, so are there enough federal resources available so states could use disaster mitigation to engage in suppression efforts before uh, they happen? And how can the federal government improve our efforts to pre-deploy assets? There's a lot to unpack there. Oh. The, uh, there's a couple of things. One is in, in regards to timing issues is the ability to obviously model the, the fire weather that is impactful to your state is looking at what conditions and parameters are involved when we have the situations that ex we experience large fire growth. 
the, in Oklahoma, the National Weather Service, uh, the duties that, uh, the work that was done was collateral to their normal duties. Uh, the bunch of dedicated uh, individuals that put their heads together and started looking at the parameters that existed during those times that we had the high to extreme fire danger and what weather systems caused that. And then the ability to look at that out three to seven days and even, even farther. And then as we got closer and closer to the day that was predicted, we would be able to really hone in where that would impact the state and then pre-deploy resources to uh, support an issue, aggressive initial attack and keep the fire small. And so looking at, at Oregon's situation, it would be where you would need to have the weather service officials or whoever that might be look at those parameters that cause those conditions for large fire growth to, to see those and predict them into the future. The declaration that you spoke of may be the uh, fire management assistance grants through FEMA. There are two different things right. at, at work here. FMAGs are, have to be applied for when the fire emergency starts. It has to be when it's ongoing and then that is a separate process than deploying resources to a particular fire. So um, how could we best utilize our meager resources that we have, and I fought fire in Oregon many times, uh, would be to know where those conditions are going to occur in advance and then have those resources pre-positioned such as we do in Oklahoma and other states. Thank you so much. And I yield back. Sorry. General lady's time has expired. Yeah. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Garcia, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the, uh, the witnesses today and uh, thank you for this uh, very important topic. Uh, I come from Southern California, North LA County in a district which it's probably the largest wildland human uh, interface uh, in the nation in terms of uh, wildfire uh, risks. Uh, and met with uh, Department of Forestry uh, personnel leadership in SoCal throughout California as well last week about the upcoming uh, season uh, in the fall. It's bad for us with the way the winds and the, and the environment uh, changes in the fall through the winter. And fire season's almost becoming a year-round thing. We just had a, a fire uh, yesterday. Actually, it was put out, 30-acre brush fire. And I want to, first of all, thank the firefighters and the, uh, the folks at the Angeles National Forest, L.A. County, for uh, containing that one very quickly. Um, and so it's been a, a good news story for California in terms of the water, right, the rain that we've gotten. Um, and I, uh, we, we see that as a good thing, helping us mitigate the drought. But we also know that that beast on the, on the horizon is, is all of those fuels drying out during the summertime, becoming uh, effectively the BTUs that are going to burn uh, in the fall. Uh, and so this is a problem we, we see coming. Um, and so what you're doing is very important for us to save lives. And I, I do see these fire operations as literally combat operations. You know, God bless our firefighters out there on the front lines, uh, uh, putting their lives on the line and, and saving homes. I, I myself have been evacuated from my home a couple of times in the last couple of decades because of these wildfires. So uh, we, we can't support them enough. Um, and because these are combat operations, you have to treat this almost like an entire kill chain from the predictive behavior of your threat, in this case it's the fires, it's the, it's the, uh, the brush, it's the prescribed burns to mitigate in advance of, uh, but especially the predictive modeling that you're doing on the weather side that feeds information to, to the warfighter, in this case the firefighters, to make uh, real-time decisions that, that ultimately save their lives and the lives of our constituents. So uh, can't thank you guys enough for, for doing what you're doing. And, um, I want you to know that anything we can do to support you on the predictive modeling side, especially uh, through NOAA and other agencies, uh, don't hesitate to, to let us know, uh, and we're happy to, to do that. We need all hands on deck right now, especially with AI and some of the other uh, capabilities coming online. Now we, we, we probably aren't fully leveraging the technologies that are available to us. Uh, and while we can't replace uh, the firefighter with a shovel and a hose, and a, in, you know, in our case we've got bulldozers out there uh, uh, doing the fire breaks and C-130s and DC-10s flying overhead, literally like a combat operation. Uh, we can't replace those folks. We need more of those folks. We need to pay them better, treat them better, but also give them these tools. So uh, to that end, I guess uh, two questions. Uh, the first is, is, is with, with the, the fast-moving development of unmanned uh, aerial vehicles, and, and frankly, even unmanned surface vehicles, ground-based uh, vehicles, is there something that we can be doing, um, and not just with these drone quadcopters that are five, you know, 10 pound widgets, but, but bigger class, you know, type two, type three class UAVs that are carrying sensors and, and infrared sensors, for instance, that, that can help feed information 
And again, not to replace the firefighter on the ground, but to help be a force multiplier, to give the firefighter information like where hotspots are, to give 24-hour persistence and surveillance overhead when maybe a helicopter flying over mountainous terrain is, is not the safest thing to do. Um, what, what are you guys seeing, I guess, uh, um, from an from a art of the possible, not, not necessarily state of the art, but also incorporating the state of the art and the art of the possible in terms of con ops to support the, the firefighter uh, in terms of these, these drones? Um, and, and I shouldn't call them drones because everyone thinks these are smaller things, but there, there are larger, you know, 10, 15 foot wingspan UAVs and then surface based um, uh, tractors, et cetera, that are unmanned. But Mr. Peverell, if you can, and frankly, anyone, if, if anyone wants to chime in here, um, from that technology perspective, what does the future of uh, firefighting look like? Well, one of the major barriers right now is actually the regulatory side. Um, and I think what needs to be done is we need to take into consideration the relative level of safety for these types of operations, whether it's operating with something that's fairly benign, like our nano drone here, or some of the larger aircraft that can carry out carry larger sensors or maybe even drop firefighting materials. Um, you know, the Federal Aviation Administration needs to put a framework in place where they can consider the relative safety of what's being attempted by the unmanned aircraft, you know, safety to the public, and also take into consideration the public safety benefits. Uh, because in many cases, you're talking about um, a tech, deploying a technology which has some level of risk, um, but the risk is far outweighed by the benefits to the public by yeah. what you can get out of it. Would you, would you say that the FP, FAA is being too conservative right now in the regula regulation of these things and, and almost adopting a zero risk mentality instead of leaning I, forward a little bit? I think bit? they are. Okay. Uh, you know, the FAA is not currently tasked with taking into consideration the overall risk benefit. You know, they're tasked with maximizing the safety of aviation. Um, so any amount of risk is often considered unacceptable. Um, which is really not, you know, not the appropriate uh, way to care about it if you want to deploy, deploy these advanced technologies in a reasonable amount of time. Okay, and I'm so. out of uh, I'm out of time, but uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair, now, chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Stevens, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our witnesses. Um, you know, we're here talking about wildfire detection and how to do it better. And I, I really appreciate the, the emphasis on interagency. I'm in Michigan and it's been quite sobering over the last month because we haven't really traditionally been one of the states that has been subject to wildfire smoke. And this was wildfires that began in Canada in uh, late May and took a month and the smoke spread uh, down to our region and across many parts of the Midwest, uh, leading to some, some head-scratching uh, realities for folks, upticks in asthma incidences, hospitals being filled up. And I was wondering if any of you could talk about some of the interagency uh, efforts vis-a-vis international uh, relationships. Uh, we've got one of the great longstanding uh, partnerships with Canada and allied friendship with our neighbor to the north. But the question that was being posed at home is, is there anything that we can do to work with uh, the Canadian government to better detect uh, fires? And are there existing mechanisms within our federal government within NOAA or some of the other agencies that are that are stepping up that allow them to to work with international governments. Go ahead, Mr. Bowler. Yes, yes, thank you. The there's a couple of different things. Early in within the last year, we've had three different calls with Alberta to talk about the use of AI and some of the uh, advances that Alberta has used in their province to detect wildfires and to evaluate smoke conditions and so, so on. And that is pretty exciting research in regards to us also, especially where we are starting to employ cameras to facilitate fire detection. So that is on the, the forefront and will be continued to be investigated. As far as international response, uh, the United States has, through the US, cooperative agreements with the U.S. Forest Service, sent numerous resources to Canada beginning in early May 
to help them with their fire situation. And that was limited at the time to specifically federal employees only, which the states have numerous resources that could also assist in those firefighting efforts. And just this week, we did receive some news from the U.S. Forest Service and through the Office of General Counsel that also state employees would be able to be deployed to Canada to assist them with their their firefighting efforts. So um, opening up the door to allow more resources to go there to help them with their situation is beneficial also to help limiting the smoke impacts to the United States. Yeah, and particularly as we talk about standards and we want to make sure that we're all speaking uh, as best as possible from the same page of, of, of standards. And um, some of the research has, has shown that since the beginning of this century, a million plus acres of f forests have, have burned every year. I think 2015 was the, the first year that uh, we hit 10 million acres um, uh, of, of forest fire. And just wondering, you know, Dr. Tahiti, uh, you know, is there anything that we could better do as we look to detect but as we also talk about per prevention uh, to bring into this conversation, and I know we're moving into this quarter 21st century mark here as we recognize, all right, the planet's getting warmer and we want to responsibly uh, lead and put into place sustainability practices. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, there are a couple of things uh, in my view that we can, uh, we can do. Uh, um, from the uh, fire and uh, weather modeling uh, perspective, uh, I think if we can uh, uh, improve the uh, modeling uh, such that it can uh, represent a better, we can uh, characterize the risk better and uh, represent the risk in our communities better, that can uh, be really helpful for the stakeholders to optimize uh, the preparedness and mitigating actions that they are uh, taking. Uh, also, we need to uh, invest uh, in uh, home hardening uh, and uh, prepare our communities uh, for uh, uh, different scenarios that can happen uh, for them. There are uh, some guidelines available uh, that, can, uh, that communities can follow, uh, but uh, we also need social sciences to really uh, educate uh, our communities about these uh, guidelines and also consider the vulnerabilities. You know, not uh, you know, all people in those communities are uh, going to afford those guidelines and uh, do these uh, home hardening uh, practices. So uh, in my view, it becomes a game of optimization and the best way to do it is to uh, uh, have a better characterization of the risk uh, throughout the landscape and uh, figure out where we need to do uh, forest management, where we need to spend the money on uh, community management and uh, home hardening. Thank you, and with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. The gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Tenney, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lucas and, and Ranking Member uh, for this hearing. And uh, I represent New York's 24th Congressional District, so we're grateful for the Small Business Innovation Research Program and also for the Mesonet Program. I do have a, qu a, a question. I'd just like to jump right in. Um, and I wanted to ask, and, and, and uh, Ms. Stevens asked me the question. We had, obviously, a lot of poor air quality from Canada uh, coming in from the forest fires that we had there throughout our all of upstate New York, which I represent. And I just had a question for you, Mr. Mr. Goller. Uh, first, uh, is there a way that uh, we can detect or predict where forest fires will be worse in spreading, you know, maybe a region that has a lot of extra underbrush or thatch? Uh, is that something that we could use as technology to say this should be a warning area? You know, I have friends that are, are forest rangers, a uh, number of them actually, who said, you know, the only reason the Adirondacks doesn't go up in flames is because you're so, it's so humid because of the failure of the state of New York to really uh, manage it properly. And I'm not talking about thinning. I'm talking about the thatch underneath and the underbrush. Is that something we could, we could identify or detect in, in, in using the, this program? Yes. There's, the fire environment is made up of three different largely three different components, each with multiple facets underneath them, but it basically fuels weather topography. The weather portion of this, we've, we've discussed at great length, and the fuels is, is something that we need to look at, not only in New York, but across the country. If you start to look at the, the forests across the United States, both either forest and rangeland, both, if you 
start to evaluate where the fuel buildup is. And as we have, uh, it was mentioned early about lacking forest management, anywhere that we don't practice active management, the fuels will continue to build. It's so can I, so would you say that this lack of management, in turn, and, and I know there's a leave it untouched by mankind, but you know, obviously the Adirondacks are a beautiful place where you know, we hosted the Olympics, uh, we have a lot of people that are engaged in winter sports up there, uh, whether it's uh, hiking and snow, snow and snowshoeing and all kinds of stuff. Would would, the, would it be a good idea to invest in, in management of those forests, uh, using you know managing the thatch, managing the underbrush, and minimizing the risk of forest yes, fire? Yes, ma'am, it would be. And is that something that you have an experience that New York is doing or not doing effectively? I, I do not have with New York. I can attest from ex personal experiences of what we've just recently done in Oklahoma using hazard mitigation work to remove hazardous fuels in and amongst communities, especially we recently completed a project in, in Washington County north of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Less than a month later after we removed the hazardous fuels, we had a wildfire impact the area and when the fire I made it to the area that was treated. The fire basically, I won't say went out, but it was such of a low impact that local firefighters were easily able to stop any spot fires that crossed the lines. And then also we saved numerous homes and prevented uh, loss of life and property in that area where we did the hazard mitigation work. That's easily transferable. And a lot of states are starting to do the hazard mitigation work because it is important. We, it's much cheaper to do the mitigation work than it is to spend millions of dollars fighting the fires as they occur. Bill, thank you. That's a great, uh, great answer. Uh, uh, Mr. Peverell, doctor, is it Dr. Peverell? Mr. Peverell, okay. Uh, thanks for being selected by the Air Force for the Defense Innovation Unit prototype development. Um, that's a great achievement. Um, just wanted to speak a little bit on the role of the SBIR and uh, what, what we're, with Weather Hive. So in my district, our big concern is snow. We have a lot of lake effect snow coming off Lake Erie and also Lake Ontario. Uh, everyone remembers, uh, I'm sure that we had seven feet of snow alone in, uh, in Orchard Park, which forced the Buffalo Bills to play in Detroit. It was so bad. Uh, but uh, we're just, I'm just questioning, what, what kind of, um, what can we do? Is that, would, the, would that technology, uh, would, the, would the weather high be able to help us know what we're getting in, would, would that be effective in helping us it, mitigate and, and then solve that issue when it actually comes into play? It, it could certainly help improve predictions. Um, one of the things that's unique about WeatherHive is that we're able to really uh, more accurately sample the boundary layer, which is the part of the atmosphere that's you know, closest to the Earth. And a lot of those type of effects that you're talking about, um, a lot of those mechanisms happen in this boundary layer region. And it's the least uh, monitored area of the atmosphere. You know, the only data we have on that area is really mostly from ground sensors, um, which are very low and pretty spread so out. So are we doing that now? Are we able to do that? We can do it with ground sensors. You know, people have towers, there's uh, sensors on Is that rooftops. technology we can use in, uh, in our region, in upstate New York? Certainly, yeah. Well, WeatherHive system is designed to spread sensors all over that boundary layer atmosphere, um, and you can sense atmospheric gradients, uh, you know, temperature, humidity, and pressure. And that can be used to feed into new types of forecasting models that can really more, much more accurately det uh, track and predict what's going to happen in those types of areas. Thank you so much. I think I'm out of time. I yield back. The gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Fauci, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this committee hearing today. And thank you to our witnesses for your testimony and for appearing before us this morning. I am proud uh, that my district, North Carolina's fourth, includes the U.S. Forest Service Southern Research Station. Um, it is an RTP-based federal research center whose research on federal wildfire and suppression expenditures was cited in last year's OMB Climate Risk Exposure Assessment. Today, I would like to mention a little bit about their research, but first, I would like to thank all wildland fire first responders who make such tremendous sacrifice and commitment on the front lines of what we are discussing today. Uh, my husband is a retired firefighter, having served for 31 years, so I know firsthand the kind of dedication that this takes, and we commend them for their service. Mr. Goler, Forest Service researchers in my district looked at available data from the U.S. Forest Service and the Department of Interior on wildfire 
um, area burned and federal suppression expenditures to project and calculate the effect of climate on federal lands burned and subsequent federal expenditures in the mid and latter half of this century. Their findings indicate that if this troubling trend continues, federal spending on wire fire um, on federal lands is expected to rise by double or triple by the mid to late century. To put this into context, federal spending for the Forest Service and Department of the Interior would rise from a historical median of $2 billion per year currently to $5.7 billion per year by the end of this century. As the cost of wildland fire suppression continues to increase faster than inflation, how can the federal government better coordinate its efforts to protect federal lands? Um, I understand from reading your testimony that National Association of State Foresters um, helps to partner with federal land management agencies through cooperative agreements and good neighbor authority. Can you please elaborate on this collaboration? Yes, ma'am. We, one of the things that is critically important, as you mentioned, is the management of those federal lands and the expenditures that occur as a result of wildfires is increasing. One of the things, if you look at the statistics for timber harvests on national forest lands over the, since 1940, the amount of timber harvested has decreased dramatically beginning in the late 80s and uh, there's, uh, there's well-published data that will, will support that in uh, numerous publications that show what timber has been harvested. Again, as the, the management and the harvest decline in, in areas, the fuel continues to build. It's, that's just nature happening. And the ability for us to remove those products for forest products is one way to reduce the amount of fuel loading. It'll reduce the uh, the size, the, the potential size of the fire. For the firefighters working on the front lines, when we are able to utilize an area that's been treated, either through forest management, through timber harvest, hazard mitigation work, whatever it is, it's much easier for us to construct control lines. The fire is easier to control. And typically, we have to go back to an area that, if, if you look at fire control and start thinking about you know, why are we having trouble and why, where can we best stop a fire? It's where we have a favorable change in fuels, weather, topography. So talking specifically about fuel, the more that we can utilize the, the material out of the forested areas for products, and uh, that reduces the fuel loading, reduces the fire intensity. It uh, allows us to more easily construct control lines and control the fires in those areas. Not only that, but it, we're locking up that material into, instead of releasing the carbon from the forest fires back into the atmosphere, we're locking that up into products that we use for our daily lives. And so there's a the win-win there in, in regards to forest management and how that impacts not only uh, our daily lives and the products that we use, but also for fire intensity and fire control and, and the expenditures on that. So I would encourage that uh, the use of forest management practices and forest har you know, timber harvesting to help as part of that puzzle to reduce the amount of expenditures for wildland fire. Thank you, and that's my time, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as someone from Georgia, I don't think we really experienced wildfires. But, uh, but I want to reflect on something that was personal, and that was the fact that in 2017 in November, uh, we had a fire up in uh, Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And fortunate or unfortunate, my wife and I had a home up there that we had sold earlier in that spring that, that was one of the homes that was consumed in that fire and burned. And, and I don't really know who I want to direct my question to, and it may be more personal, Mr. Chairman, than anything, but I'm just trying to learn where we had the failure at in that fire because we had people that lost their lives, and, and it spread so fast. So was there, is there a communications gap that we were missing that we've learned from, that we've, that we've improved on? And um, the severity of that fire, is there something that 
I don't know, Noah or someone could have been doing to help locals understand just how bad that fire was and how quick it spread? I'd be glad to answer that question. I was happened to be in Gatlinburg two weeks before the fire occurred and then also a couple of weeks afterwards. And we were there as a part of a National Wildfire Coordinating Group Risk Management Committee meeting, meeting with the Great Smoky Mountain National Park and also the Gatlinburg Fire Department and uh, Pigeon Forge and a number of others to look at the potential for loss there in that area, being that it's a, re a resort community and many of those cabins and houses that were up in that fire area are traditionally rented and a lot of uh, transitional folks going through there. The ability for them to understand what the potential was was very low because of uh, just, in, just numerous factors. The, the situation there in the Smokies traditionally with the, the humidity, the rainfall, the, the climato climatological conditions that exist don't really contribute to a fire of that magnitude. But however, in November of 2016, when the fire occurred, they were experiencing a long-term drought. Therefore, there in the, the, the Smoky Mountains, the fuels and terrain were just ripe for the, the loss that occurred from that, that incident, along with the fact that uh, the evacuation information, the routes in and out, mostly single access, one way in, one way out, that limited the evacuation possibilities for the folks that, that perished in that fire. Uh, that those were lessons learned that have been carried on in other places now because of because of that tragedy. The the things that we can do now and the things that actually existed then were more to uh, alert the public as to what the potential is in the areas that they either visit or live. The National Fire Protection Association has a site called Firewise USA that promotes the things that they can do personally, that individuals can do personally for, around their homes for defensible space to protect their homes from wildfire approaching. The National Cohesive Wildfire Strategy is employed across the country in order to protect communities and make them more resilient. Uh, but when, we, when we talk specifically about that fire and others that, um, that have occurred, it, it goes back to evacuation information, warning the public as to what they have. Gatlinburg at the time had a siren that was to be sounded when they needed to leave and to alert the public that there was an issue. And when that fire occurred and electricity went out, the siren died. And so, you know, there were multiple failures there that now I'm sure have been addressed that would allow the public to be more alerted and, and warned. We've taken those lessons back home to be able, we have an area that's very similar in Southeast Oklahoma that we're, we've, we've purchased evacuation signage and we're working with cabin owners to alert them what the possibility is for those that, that come from Dallas, Fort Worth area that have no idea what wildfire means to them in an area like that that is really intended in their minds just for recreation, but they don't realize the risk that they're putting themselves in. So state forestry agencies across the country are well aware of the situation. We're doing a lot to alert not only the public, uh, but those that come in for recreational opportunities of what the dangers are for wildfire. And, we, and Georgia is a, a great supporter of fire across the United States. The Georgia Forestry Commission uh, Tim Lauer Moore is your state forester. He's a great guy, and they do a lot of work with wildfire in Georgia and also support Florida and, and all the southern states. So thank you for them. And anything you can do to support them it would be greatly appreciated. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ed. Gentleman back. Eagles back. The chair now recognizes the ranking member from California, Ms. Lofgren, for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to all of you uh, for your excellent testimony, which I've read. Now, Dr. Tahiti, in your testimony, uh, you highlight some of the concerning gaps in our knowledge about the behavior of wildfire at the wildland urban interface. Specifically, you mentioned that we have a poor understanding of the differences between released energy from structural burns versus vegetation clusters, and that none of the current fuel layer inputs for operational models <clears throat> consider structures and urban developments as flammable. Can you? elaborate on the, on the knowledge gaps, what they mean about the, our ability to accurately model fire as it transitions from wildland to urban areas, 
and if you're able to address this, certainly not, we don't have wildfires in every part of the United States, but we have smoke in every part of the United States, and what kind of mix of fuel uh, leads to toxic reactions uh, to that smoke? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, to address uh, the first part of your question uh, on uh, what are the knowledge gaps, as I stated in my written testimony, uh, uh, there are uh, significant knowledge gaps in uh, knowing uh, um, uh, how much energy is being released uh, when you have a structure that is uh, on fire. Um, uh, and uh, kind of scaling it up to the different layouts of the structures, different types of materials that, uh, you know, structures that, are, uh, that, uh, that we have in our communities, and uh, try to map that into the current fuel layers. Uh, so that's uh, been uh, challenging, and I think uh, it needs uh, more work. There are some uh, works being done uh, in different institutions. Um, I think Berkeley Fire Lab is uh, working on it, and uh, also uh, Colorado, Colorado State University, they are uh, uh, building uh, risk platforms uh, that can uh, estimate the risk of wildfires going through the buoy areas. But we still need to uh, know a lot uh, about the specificity of the structures and how it translates to heat transfer processes and uh, uh, map it accordingly. Uh, to address uh, the second uh, part of your question uh, in terms of how we can improve this, um, as I mentioned, um, uh, a lot of uh, the fire models, especially the operational ones that we use, are designed for the objective of uh, uh, predicting the fire behavior in the remote areas. So we have these large uh, uh, pixel size uh, fuel layers uh, of uh, 30 meters by 30 meters. Uh, when it comes to uh, wildland urban interface areas, we need to uh, reduce it down to uh, meters scale, um, you know, the, or sometimes uh, even uh, uh, smaller to have a really better understanding of uh, the fire behavior in, the, in those areas. So if we can uh, just uh, work on these low-hanging fruits and improve the uh, quality resolution uh, and frequency of the data, that currently goes to our operational models. Uh, we can uh, improve our uh, predictions and uh, characterization of the risk uh, by a lot. In terms of the uh, smoke and uh, which type of vegetation uh, uh, releases uh, uh, the uh, more toxins, it really depends on uh, first the type of the vegetation and also the conditions of the fuel, uh, the fuel moisture content that uh, that vegetation has, how well uh, it is uh, uh, being burned, so what is the combustion efficiency of that? So it's uh, different depending on uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the properties of the fuel and, and weather. Let me just get one more quick question for anybody who has an answer. The um, Wildlife Fire Risk Reduction Act is being reintroduced and it asks the federal government to play a coordinating role. I was at a very in interesting discussion at NASA Ames several months ago uh, with um, federal agencies, local agencies, academic, including San Jose State, uh, as well as private sector. And one of the issues that they identified was that we don't really have a way to distribute even the data that we have, put aside the data that we're missing. Do you have thoughts on how we might better coordinate the distribution and the standards for which the data is distributed? Any of you? Sure. I, I think federal collaboration on development of new standards for, uh, and data platforms for the distribution of this data is very important. A lot of that's happening at the state level right now. Um, I think that's the place where NOAA could do uh, very well to, to build some new platforms and data standards around that type of information because there's really not a, a federal standard for that currently. Thank you. My time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And the ranking member's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Obernolte, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to say a special thank you to you for conducting this hearing on a topic that is really critically important to me and the people that I represent. I represent a very rural district in California. As I'm sure everyone is aware, California has experienced some of the worst wildfire seasons in the entire history of our state just in the last couple of years. And unfortunately, that situation is predicted to get worse, not better, uh, as climate change exacerbates the, the decreasing density of the fuel sources. Uh, I have had the unfortunate experience of being evacuated out of my community several times due to wildfire risk. Uh, in the times that I've lived there, 
yet, uh, last year, in fact, uh, we got an aerial, uh, an air show that we got to watch, you know, as uh, we had aerial assets put out a fire that came within about a mile of my community before it was finally stopped. So this is a really critically important topic for me. Um, Mr. Goler, it, thank you for the work that you're doing in Oklahoma. Uh, I was very interested in the parts of your testimony that concerned using technology to leverage the existing firefighting assets that we have. Uh, you were talking about its applicability to forecasting the severity of wildfires and the uh, potential for them. But I I'm I'm, uh, would like to talk about whether or not we're, we've considered the use of technology to more quickly detect uh, forest fires because, uh, you know, we have tremendous capability now, aerial assets that we can dispatch uh, very quickly to get to uh, nascent fires. But uh, if, if, if we detect them early and we have a flame front that's like an acre, we can use those assets to quickly put those fires out. Uh, if we don't detect them and we don't dispatch them until the flame front is tens of acres or hundreds of acres, then we can't do it with just aerial assets. We have to coordinate with ground-based assets, and that allows the time, the fire time to spread uh, and get out of control. So uh, I'm very interested in the possibility of using these new low-Earth orbit satellites that have the resolution to detect with with thermal sensors a flame front of less than an acre and maybe pairing that with artificial intelligence to uh, be able to distinguish between a large campfire and, you know, and lightning hitting a tree. Is that something that you've considered and do you think that that's a worthwhile effort? It, absolutely, and we, we do utilize the GO-16, 17 satellites that the National Weather Service employs to do wildland fire detection now statewide. The, when we first started doing this in 2016, the satellite resolution, our detection, capa the detection capabilities was typically two mile accuracy, and now it's down to oftentimes within a quarter mile and even, even closer, and sometimes even able to detect a car sized fire. So the, the use of those satellites and AI, coupled with AI, would be absolutely awesome to uh, help you with detecting those fires while they're small and then the aggressive initial attack to keep them, keep them small when they're able to do something with them is, is critical. So yes, if you can, uh, the one thing with the, the system that we're currently employing in Oklahoma and using the National Weather Service, that is available in a number of other states. Not every state is, is using that as we are. Our uh, offices, forecast offices, Oklahoma, Texas, and now Kansas, Whenever they do detect a fire on the high to extreme days, they send us a text that shows us the location, shows us the nearest fire weather conditions from the Oklahoma Mesonet, which is a system of remote weather stations across the state. It gives us a map where the fire is located and then also tells us how it was detected and some other basic information on that particular fire. We're able to get that information to the local responders, the emergency management, the fire departments, oftentimes before it's reported by the public to the 911 dispatch centers. Not only that, but the forecasting that they're doing allows us to pre-position those resources because they base that on a probabilistic system as opposed to deterministic. And so as we see those systems developing, uh, our forecasters in conjunction with this Southern Great Plains Wildfire Outbreak Group, which would be transferable to your state as well, they show us within a certain percent, this is where the large fire occurrence can will happen. 30%, 50%, and they dial that in to the point that we can have those resources pre-positioned for those quick initial attack. We've seen a reduction in those large fires in those areas because of that focused effort that we've had. So yes, it would be easy, I believe, to do that with California as well. Right. Well, I think that uh, you know a lot of the assets you're talking about are geostationary assets. Yes. Uh, with low Earth orbit, we have the potential of having much higher resolutions. And even with the drone technology that I know we've been testifying about, you know, uh, I'm very encouraged about the possibility of having drone swarms, not uh, sampling weather, but also detecting fires. Yeah. But I see I'm out of time. Let's oh. continue to work on this issue. Thank you very much for your testimony. Yeah. I yield back. Time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Frost, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the recent Canadian wildfires are an example of the growing destruction of the climate crisis a threat that transcends borders, can't build a wall around it. And it's not just that. These fires show how when it comes down to climate change, 
we're all we're not all in the same boat. Um, seniors, folks with respiratory issues, uh, are part of the most vulnerable community when we talk about this. That even includes me, as someone like millions of Americans. I'm um, asthmatic and have been my entire life. People with breathing problems or people who may need help evacuating also need the earliest possible notice. Uh, Mr. Goler, can you speak to the role NOAA plays in getting critical information about wildfires to the public and first responders? Their, their mission with protecting lives and property in the cooperative agreement, well, not cooperative agreement, cooperation that we enjoy with them is what allows us to be able to get the information to the public in a, in a very timely and fast manner. And so uh, to be able to foster those relationships, it'd be, it, it, it's in, imperative that the local forestry agencies, Florida Forest Service, for example, to be able to get with the various National Weather Service forecast offices, get those relationships built, and also work on that warning criteria, the ability to transfer to the public the information regarding where fires exist or could exist. Is, uh, is critical. Can you elaborate a little bit on the state, the current state and effectiveness of the fire um, hazard communication system? The, um, it, it, it varies across the country. And uh, I guess I, I really can't speak a whole lot to f the way Florida works right now in regards to communicating the hazards to the public. But in other, other areas of the country, uh, it, it's going to vary state by state, and also how the, the state forestry agency, the local emergency, state emergency management, local emergency managers, the relationship that they have with one another in communicating to the public what the hazards are, either current or forecast. So it, again, it's going to be incumbent on the agencies to work together to improve that process. Yeah, just a few weeks ago here in D.C. when the, the smoke was, inc was incredibly thick, um, you know, I had my staff work from home, but not many people have that choice, and folks have to, you know, commute through the toxic yellow haze. Another group of important workers who face such health threats are uh, first responders and firefighters. Mr. Goler, can you speak to the challenges firefighters face in their career and how we in Congress can better support their efforts in protecting others, especially when it comes down to wildfires? Yes, we in the, the National Wildfire Coordinating Group has a smoke committee that has been established and has been for a number of years. And the smoke committee looks at the, the various aspects of the wildland fire smoke. Obviously, it's a lot different for vegetative material and the smoke produced, and especially now that we have to also address the smoke issues related to the wildland urban interface when homes burn, cars, and so on. It's a much different picture than we used to have back in the early days of uh, firefighting here in the United States. And so the smoke committee does a lot of work in regards to not only predicting the smoke impacts to communities, the, uh, the notification of communities when a large fire exists. Typically, it's those that are what you, we used to call campaign fires, those that lasted for weeks, weeks on end, and how those would impact um, various communities across the, not only the state, the local area, but also the state as well. The, we have now air resource advisors that are put in place and smoke monitoring equipment to be able to provide the, the, the public with the most accurate information possible in regards to particulate matter and what would impact their lives on a day-to-day -day basis and, and when to issue those warnings when they need to stay inside and so on. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tahiti, better forecasting means faster evacuations. I'm curious how we can more quickly deploy new and effective promising modeling. Thank you for the question. Uh, in my view, uh, the fastest way is to really build on uh, what we currently have. Uh, we have models uh, that are operational and they are uh, working uh, with uh, some level of uncertainty. But uh, if we can reduce the uncertainty in the uh, predictions of these current models, uh, then uh, we'll uh, probably have a better understanding of the risk and also uh, do a better job on forecasting. Uh, so the uh, highest priority uh, from the uh, modeling standpoint uh, would be to improve the uh, resolution, quality, and frequency of the data layers that goes into these models and uh, improve them. And then uh, if we can invest on uh, the observational campaigns, uh, the experimental campaigns, uh, to better observe these uh, processes um, uh, free from contamination from uh, suppression activities, 
uh, then we can have a better understanding of the physics and then we can implement them in the models. Yeah. Thank you all for your life-saving work. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Weber, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Goler, I guess these are for you. I came in late. So is it Geller or Goler? Goler. Okay. I, I, forgive me if some of this is redundant. I was in another uh, markup. Regarding Messinet, um, we know it's in Oklahoma. It's, I think you said in your testimony it's in other states. How many other states? I'm not exactly sure how many other states employ a system like that. Okay. Uh, and how long has Messinet been in existence? Hmm, I'm going to say since the late 90s, maybe, or early 90s. I'm not exactly sure, but 20 years. Yeah. Okay. And uh, there's a, according to what I read, there's 100 weather, it, it uses basically 100 weather, but it's not in Texas, right? Nothing no, you know about like I that in Texas. So. Okay. It is kind of amazing, actually. Well, I know, because <laughs> things are bigger and better in Texas. I can't believe that. <laughs> uh, but uh, so it's, you, you say it's been there about 20 years. Are they, are those 100 weather stations, are they, do, do you know how they're positioned? Are they in concentric overlapping zones? Or those zones where they, those weather stations are just happen to be there already? They were they were deployed across state. Every county in, in the state has at least one or two. Okay. They're internet accessible 24 hours a day. They update every five minutes. <laughs> and that gives us the ability for, as fire managers, uh, you know, prediction of fire weather is critically important sure. to know what's coming. And the Mesonet stations give us the ability to look during a fire event to see what the, how the weather is changing across the state and when it will impact the actual fire location. So we transition from, say, uh, depending on the National Weather Service to tell us, uh, they still do, don't get me wrong, and there's still a critical piece of that puzzle to give us the advance warning of weather systems, frontal, frontal passages, and so on. But it also, the, just the general, the guy out in the field working on, on the fire can pull up his phone, iPad, and look at those mesonet stations and see how the relative humidity, the wind speeds, the temperature will be changing throughout the course of the day and see when that will impact their fire. I got gotcha. you. And maybe you may or may not know the answer to this. How many counties in Oklahoma? Maybe that's a chairman question. Number of counties in Oklahoma? 77. 77. Well, there's 254 counties in Texas. You know, think, we said Texas is bigger. I don't know if we could get one all 254 counties. I hear that a century lot. ago. We picked up three counties from Texas in the Supreme Court ruling. So uh -huh. just a side note. Yeah. yeah. Well, don't get any more ideas because those days are over. But uh, the reason is NOAA very proactive in doing this and, and trying to get other states more counties involved, or do you know? Well, N NOAA is. For the Mesonet, it's Oklahoma State University, University of Oklahoma, and the Oklahoma Climatological Survey. Those are the three entities that actually uh, began the Mesonet. It was a collaborative effort between those. And so uh, as far as NOAA in Texas, I, I could not address that. Okay, just but curious. It, and uh, is there any kind of cost estimate involved as to what the system cost or what it, it does cost? To I, I don't know the answer to that. No. It's a, oh, it's a bargain, absolutely. It is a bargain. And and if you and I, I see where you actually had the background of going to work for the was it the U.S. Forest and Wildlife in 1980. Mm -hmm. So you were 10 years old when you started, right? That's correct. <laughs> so um, I guess you're, you've watched it for a long time. All that to say, you've been paying attention a long time. How would you rate the success rating of this system? Is it a good, bad, better, the best thing out there since sliced bread? Give us your the thought. Mesonet system. Mm -hmm. It is a great tool, fantastic tool, and as we bring resources into Oklahoma to help us during some of our fire emergencies and other fire behavior folks and other firefighters, they are amazed that we have this available to us, and they wish that they had it in their state as well. Anything better in the country? Not that I've seen. Not yet anything better. Um, false alarms, let's move over to false alarms. One of the questions was, uh, how, False alarms or even bad information. How do false alarms or bad information impact the allocation of firefighting resources and general response? Have you ex have we ex have that system experienced false alarms? Can you give us examples and how do you respond to those? You know, typically we do have false alarms, yes, but it's not as many as you might think, and it really has not caused us a tremendous amount of impact that that hurts our system or uh, causes us to, to miss one fire because of a false report somewhere else. Okay. 
Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield back 10 seconds. I would simply note to my colleague from Texas that Linda Lucas runs the farm. She is the herdsman, and I never call home without checking Mesonet first to see what her attitude is going to be. <laughs> Gentleman's time has expired. Chair now recognizes uh, uh, the gentlelady from Colorado, Ms. Carvero, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lucas and uh, Ranking Member Loughran as well. And I appreciate our witnesses today taking time to discuss fire weather prediction capabilities, a very important issue in Colorado where we have experienced some of our largest wildfires in state history in the last five years. Uh, I have to start off by sharing that I recently visited NIST um, at their Boulder campus, and I had a wonderful time learning about some of the projects that they have been working on, including their work on leveraging VR tech to help first responders, such as firefighters, dig digitally map out areas um, affected by fire. These types of technological advancements help firefighters suppress wildfires and in turn save lives and property. Um, but it also helps limit the health impacts on firefighters by limiting their exposure and giving them more information as they navigate uh, fire affected areas. Uh, Mr. Goler, in your testimony, you touch on the state fire assistance and volunteer assistance programs. Based on your experience, can you discuss some of the health impacts impacts that firefighters specifically face and how those impacts uh, could be mitigated? Some of the, the health impacts that we face is the environmental impacts from not only the fire itself, but also working in the extreme conditions that we, we must fight fire in. During a drought, during summer months, when we have high temperatures, the, the problems that are usually that we face are uh, heat stress type heat-related injuries, uh, those that we have to try to mitigate through uh, messaging to our firefighters on hydration and, and taking care of themselves, cooling, and, and so on. There's a lot of work done by the NWCG Risk Management Committee and the, and the uh, uh, National Interagency Fire Center and the Fire Lab in Missoula, Montana that has that looks at the stress on firefighters and what we can do to reduce that as they work during those hot months, but also in many areas of the country, especially in the south, when we fight fire during the winter months, we we have to work in extreme cold as well. And some of our heavy equipment operators that have to operate a piece of equipment during very cold temperatures, especially the open cab, the older older dozers, it's extremely hard on them. Uh, those are the environmental impacts of smoke. Again, the NWCG Smoke Committee has done a lot of research on the impacts to the uh, lung functions. The one thing that is somewhat of an, an issue for us is the fact that we don't have a lot of information regarding uh, firefighter mortality after they retire on what happened. You know, there's a lot of um, information there that we're, we're not party to, that we don't have accessible to us. And so to understand the long-term impacts of smoke exposure to wildland firefighters has, has been a little bit difficult to ascertain. We know what the immediate impacts are and how to mitigate those, but as far as long-term, that research is gonna be, is, is ongoing and, and to try to figure out what that would be, so. Thank you. Well, I'm certainly glad that that research is ongoing. We need to, to know the health effects on uh, the men and women um, that, that save property and, and lives, um, especially in places like uh, Colorado. Uh, switching gears, I would like to discuss fire hazard hazard communications. Many of us have focused on that today. Um, uh, so this question may also be for you, Mr. Uh, Goler. Uh, like many of my colleagues, I believe that it is critical to have effective communication systems to ensure first responders and residents can act quickly. Uh, and like many um, families in my district, I come from a bilingual household, and many of my constituents are in um, households that really prefer one language um, over, over English, um, uh, to, to be frank. Uh, do you uh, know of any current state, uh, the current state and effectiveness of multilingual hazard communications for families like those? I, I can't speak to the effectiveness. I do, I do know that when we're in an area that our public information officers and we're working in an area that has various languages that are spoken there that we do employ uh, multiple language public information releases to try to impact or try to inform uh, the public, uh, you know, has, when we're in an area like Arizona and Spanish is the primary language, we do a lot of media releases and so on in, in Spanish. In Oklahoma, I've done a, probably more 
interviews with Telemundo and some of the other uh, Spanish-speaking media outlets than, than sometimes I do with the traditional media outlets in Oklahoma. And so um, it, it, it does, we do pay attention to that fact and try to get that information out as, as we can, depending on what areas of the country that we're working. Well, I certainly appreciate all of your work. Um, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlelady's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Miller, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. First, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter from the Competitive Carriers Association regarding the importance of wireless service and wildfire detection and mitigation. Seeing no objections, ordered. Thank you very much, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. It's great to have you. Um, question for Mr. Goler. I'm hearing more and more of this term fire year instead of fire season, recognizing that we are starting to see fires at unusual times in unusual places. The current wildfire smoke issues we have seen all the way in Ohio from fires in eastern Canada are a prime example of just that. We've never seen that before. Can you talk about the prevalence and nature of wildfire in different parts of our country? Is wildfire the same in the east as it is in the west? Are we seeing more fire, and why is that? The, the difference, the, the, the fire year term has come about because we do actually fight fire across the country for the entire year. The southern United States, for example, our fire season is from January 1st through December 31st. But we break that into two distinct seasons, the dormant season and the growing season. Other parts of the country where snowfall and snowpack limits firefighting during the winter months, it's a little different. But as you look at the United States and how fire transitions across the country during the course of the year, it, the, the fire season, if you wanted to call it that, it moves around. As earlier, one of the representatives from California mentioned October, November, that in Southern California is when the, the change in the seasons there affects the fire growth, the winds change, and so on. So we, we are very aware and have been for a number of years on how fires move across the country and where the, those impacts will be. The one issue that we face sometimes is when we start to see weather impacts, see drought in various parts of the country, and some, when the drought impacts two or more areas at once, it starts to become an issue as far as resource deployment. So those are things that we constantly are watching and seeing how we can, can do that. Uh, fire is different in various parts of the country. Difference in fuels, difference in what burns. Uh, southern U.S., especially along the coastal areas, we look at palmetto, gallberry, things like that that are waxy and have their volatile fuels, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina going up across the, the coastal areas. But as you move inland, we start to transition into pine fuels, hardwoods, and, and so on. And so the, the fire managers in the various states are well aware of what their primary fuels are, when their fires are most active, and what they need to do in terms of resource deployment and bringing in re when they need to bring in resource to supplement their, their state agencies or the federal agencies to be aware of uh, and be prepared for any fire response. The, the federal uh, agencies, they, they call it fire severity. They bring in severity resources to preposition to be ready. States, we use our forest fire compacts to do that. And so as one area of the country is burning and the other is not, then we support each other. And so, um, again, it, it, uh, it all is based on fuels, fuel conditions, it, uh, the, the management of the, the forested areas, the rangelands. It's, it's all a very complex issue that we, uh, that we constantly are trying to maintain our situational awareness of where those issues will occur. Thank you for that detailed answer. It's much appreciated. Mr. Peverill, are there obstacles to the widespread implementation and use of drone technologies? How might the government facilitate the use of these technologies? Are there regulatory hurdles that you could see happening because of it? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, the regulatory framework currently doesn't allow advanced operations of drones, like we're talking with our system. You know, there's no uh, path in place for us to have widespread use of a system like WeatherHive nationally. Um, those have been in development for years now at the FAA, um, but they have yet to produce a, a real framework to do that. And as I mentioned before, I mean, it's really important for them to put in place a system that considers both the risk of a given operation um, when, when, when 
uh, planning the method by which you allow permission and also consider the public safety benefits, uh, which they don't currently do. You know, this is a system that has significant public safety benefits and minimal, if any, safety implications once implemented properly. Thank you for that. Uh, I have a couple more questions, but I'm going to submit them for the record. Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Lee, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our panel of witnesses today for your time and your expertise on this subject matter. Uh, back home in western Pennsylvania, we don't experience wildfires, uh, but that does inspire our communities from the significant and far-reaching effects that these disasters have. Large amounts of smoke, pollutants, and particulate matter are released into the air, having uh, severely detrimental effects on air quality. This poses health risk to uh, those throughout my district, which is uh, already known to have some of the worst air quality in the nation. Wildfire smoke can exacerbate respiratory illnesses and contributes to smog, leading to various health problems for vulnerable populations, such as the children, the elderly, and individuals with pre-existing respiratory conditions, such as asthma, bronchitis, or COPD, of course. The raging wildfires in Canada are still burning and have been for weeks. The smoke from these fires have led to several code red air quality alerts, which indicates unhealthy levels of pollution across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Not too long ago, many of us woke up to the scenes of hazy orange skies akin to those in sci-fi movies. Residents were advised to frequently check their local air quality through resources such as airnow.gov, Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, and the Allegheny County Health Department. The work that agencies and governments at all levels do to protect our communities are invaluable, and every tool at our disposal must be utilized to support them. So we can't deny that growing frequency and severity of wildfires are influenced by climate change. While we're here today to discuss pathways forward to improve quality, use, distribution, and accessibility of fire weather data, real solutions will lie in addressing the root causes of climate change. Implementing effective mitigation and adaptation strategies will be crucial in preventing force, uh, future wildfires and reducing their impact. Unprecedented extreme weather events are becoming alarmingly normal. This is not sustainable for Earth or humanity. If we don't stand up now to change how we interact with this planet, there will be nothing for future generations to inherit. So Dr. Tahiti, how is climate change affecting how we train and educate emergency response officials in the field? And can you highlight specific changes that you have experienced in academia? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I can uh, answer this to the best of my knowledge. I'm not an expert in uh, uh, educating first responders. Uh, um, but in San Jose State uh, University, we have a, um, a new minor called Wildfire Minor. Uh, minor and uh, um, uh, the College of Science hosts this. Um, so the, the, the students who uh, go through this minor, uh, they get familiarity with uh, fire weather indices that are available, uh, and uh, they can assess uh, the uh, um, situations, the atmospheric situations uh, that are conducive to fire. Uh, and they can transition some of this knowledge uh, to the work that they do. Uh, uh, if some of them choose to be first responder, uh, that would be very, uh, very helpful for them. Uh, and um, in terms of the education, uh, uh, we definitely need to do more work on workforce development uh, in, uh, in this area. Uh, because uh, uh, the more awareness we have about the uh, problems that we are dealing with and the uh, more awareness that we have, uh, the uh, uh, urgency of the uh, problem, uh, uh, the better uh, answers we can, we can have for them. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pavarill, what opportunities exist for input from private citizens for quicker wildfire response and improved fire hazard communication? Uh, well, I think better access to data about the boundary layer, you know, the areas that are impact movement of wildfires, I think would significantly uh, enhance the ability to inform the public about where they're gonna go. You know, as you mentioned, the air quality uh, is a major challenge. It's obviously in the, you know, in the air the public is breathing, um, but being able to study the boundary layer uh, using tools like drones and other systems um, will really allow us to better predict um, and, mm -hmm. and influence uh, urban planning around air quality. Yeah, your company provides products like uh, that utilize robotics and AI to create solutions to the problems. Could you share what you think the potential is for integrating data and solutions from fields like agriculture into fire weather data to utilize cross-cutting approaches? 
Uh, yeah, well, you know, we were talking about the Masonet system. Um, it's a great example of a, a data platform tool that's been used to inform fire weather for decades. Um, a system like ours is sort of like a Masonet enhanced. You know, you can, you can gather data throughout the atmosphere between Masonet stations um, and really deliver a much more dense matrix of data uh, that can be used to enhance predictions. You know, and that sort of data source really doesn't exist right now. It isn't available to researchers, and it isn't available to inform um, public policy and you know, planning tools. Thank you. That's my time. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Virginia, Ms. McClellan, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, uh, for planning this hearing, which, as we've heard, is very timely, uh, given the experiences we had recently with the wildfires. And while we have some familiarity with wildfires in Virginia, uh, I don't think we have ever had smoke travel from Canada before, or at least not in, in my recent memory. Um, and, and we know that, that as we continue uh, the air quality impacts uh, that we saw that were historic and unprecedented are probably going to be much more prevalent going forward. And as we've touched on, but I want to explore a little bit deeper, um, you know, I'm concerned we're going to continue to see increasingly severe wildfire years uh, as a result of climate change, which is exacerbating heat and drought conditions and, and making it much easier for uh, fires to catch and spread. Um, so Dr. Tahiti, could you describe in a little more, you know, specifically uh, the ways in which climate change has impacted fire dynamics? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, um, yeah, the climate change effects um, uh, uh, the, and the way they are uh, affecting the fire dynamics or the regime of fires that we see these days uh, is a confluence of a lot of different parameters. But the general consensus is that uh, the climate change uh, leads to prolonged droughts, uh, uh, warmer uh, and hotter temperatures, and that leads to uh, drier fuels and lowers the fuel uh, moisture content in our uh, uh, landscape, and uh, really uh, builds up the platform uh, for uh, uh, any ignition with any source uh, that can happen, and then it uh, goes from a, a single ignition point to uh, large weather, uh, fire weather systems that we have these days. Uh, so these are uh, uh, the main um, uh, you know, factors that uh, we all know, and uh, there are evidence for this. Another uh, um, factor that climate change uh, makes an impact on is the soil moisture. Uh, soil moisture is also known to be a very important parameter in uh, the health of the uh, biological systems that we have throughout the landscape and also uh, uh, having some correlations uh, with uh, the fuel moisture and uh, uh, how uh, the fire dynamics changes. And thank you for that. And do you see any updates to data collection or modeling needed to account for these changes or do you think the modeling is okay as is? Uh, the modeling, uh, we do uh, need to do a lot more uh, in modeling uh, perspective, and uh, one of the uh, avenues that we can improve the current state of the models is exactly that. We need to address the quality resolution and uh, frequency of the data layers for these uh, current models that we have. We do need to better understand the dynamics of the fire at different scales. Um, uh, as you know, uh, fire happens uh, uh, to be uh, a multi-scale uh, process, starting with a uh, flame at a very small scales, and then how it grows to be a uh, large weather system such as Pyro CBs, uh, we still have a lot to learn and uh, uh, fill that knowledge gap. Um, so, uh, yeah. Thank you, and uh, touching on community resiliency a little bit, Mr. Goler, um, could you discuss steps that Congress could take to better support vulnerable communities and anticipating wildfire scenarios and preparing mitigations? It's one of the things that we can do. One, the vulnerable communities is uh, the hazard mitigation, removing fuel. We, we've talked about climate change and the effects of climate change. One thing we can do to reduce the severity and impact of wildfires and how much smoke is generated and how much particulate matter is to remove fuel. And right now, our fuel buildup in the forested areas of the United States and, and uh, in the rangeland areas where management has been largely reduced over the years, there's a number of reasons for that. There's cultural changes, there's changes in the, the, the demographics 
the family farms aren't as prevalent as they used to be. We've got people moving into the city areas and, and therefore a lot of land is relatively unmanaged and left alone just to grow and produce fuel, whether it be the rangelands or the forest lands in the United States. And the communities that are out in and amongst those areas, the hazard mitigation work that can occur is, is critical to protect those communities from the impacts, not only from a fire directly impacting or directly impinging into those areas, uh, but also to limit the, the smoke generated from the, any, any wildfires in the areas that would um, cause them to have, have issues with that. And so addressing the one component in the fire environment that we do have the wherewithal to do is, is working on fuel reduction work and doing that ahead in advance of fire occurrence. Thank you, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back, the chair next recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Isa, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Hugo, I'm gonna follow up on that. Uh, since you're in Oklahoma, right? Yes, sir. Uh, would you uh, would you say you do a pretty good job of brush removal? We're doing a lot better job. The one the one problem the one thing that we have in Oklahoma is mostly private land, and the, there's some difficulty in addressing those issues on on private lands where the landowner really does not want to do anything, and so uh, getting the word out the the uh, information to them on what they can do and what we can do for them. We do have some grants now available to us and through the federal government and also some of the state things that we're doing to affect the fuel work on private lands. But as you know, California is the opposite. We are exactly. mostly public lands. Yes, sir. Native American, federal and state. Uh, and we don't do a very good job. We don't use the funds to clear the brush. Just the opposite, we can't get a permit to do it most of the time, right? That is an issue, yes. And the smoke goes from west to east. So the fact is that uh, our, our annual fires, because we don't abate the brush, in fact affect most of the rest of the country with the, uh, the flyover smoke. We do have issues, yes. And some of the things that you could do, some of the things Congress could do would be to make that a little easier for those public land, U.S. Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, others to be able to affect that hazard mitigation work on federal lands to reduce the amount of would you the fire danger. Would you suggest that we preempt state law in this case uh, because it flies over other states when we, d when we find ways to, to stop it on a state level? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. California seems to stand out for a reason, and that is that you go into our, our courts, you, you get one after another delays. Uh, I was asking, do you think that, that uh, committees here in Congress should consider, on behalf of the other 47 lower 48 states, that we should potentially uh, preempt the state of California from uh, its, its willingness to, uh, to not clear brush? As an Oklahoman, uh, where the smoke flies over you. Yeah, fortunately, our, our wind speeds, typically, we, we don't have many issues for very long in, in Oklahoma. It's usually in Kansas or Nebraska by the time that it starts to be a, a problem. But uh, that aside, you know, there are things that, that we need to do across the country. One, it, you know, when, when you do have regulations in one state that are more stringent than what the federal government offers, uh, they have to look at what, what is the impact of that to the state. Is it something that we, they can do to reduce those impacts from wildfire, from smoke issues and whatnot? Are they causing more harm than they're doing good by the regulations that they impose? And so, no, I would not suggest that the federal government come in and tell the states what to do. But again, it... But a common 50-state standard would probably make sense at least as to how you go about it and how long it takes to get a permit. Are you talking about for burning or for... Well, for clearing, clearing brush. You know, California uses the Environmental Protection Act, uh, Endangered Species Act, and so on. They use it to go further than the federal government does in your home state. Mm -hmm. Well, look, enough about California. Let me ask you another question. Uh, direct hire authority uh, for firefighters. Uh, you want to give us the idea of how important it is to be able to ramp up and do this without going through a long process? 
it's, it is uh, a, a great thing to have that direct hire authority. We, the number of wildland firefighters across the country, whether it be state or federal, has diminished greatly over the years. And part of the issue is the, not, is, is the pay. You know, the, now, nowadays, a lot of wildland firefighters could make more money doing something else, working at just about anywhere. And so we have been focusing on increasing wildland firefighter pay, which would go a long ways to help that. We've lost a number of hotshot crews over the years. Our, our crew strength has diminished greatly across the country. You know, we're the 20 person crews, not only type one, type two, type two IA crews has continually decreased over the years. So our ground firefighting efforts has uh, greatly been diminished. So direct hire authority would be great. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I think I got my two points across and I appreciate the entire panel. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Ross, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lucas and Ranking Member Lofgren for holding this hearing and thank you to the panelists for joining us today. Canada was not the only place facing wildfires in June. In North Carolina, tens of thousands of acres of the Green Swamp Nature Preserve burned, causing road closures and air quality issues in the southeastern portion of our state. The number of annual wildfires in North Carolina has steadily increased over the past two decades. And it's imperative to understand the behavior of wildfires to effectively predict where they will start and how they will behave. My first question is for Dr. Tahiti, um, and you touched on this a little bit about the gaps that we might have in wildland forest uh, fire mo uh, modeling. So could you go back to those gaps and just list them out for the committee? And then also let us know whether investing more in this modeling would be helpful. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, in terms of the uh, major gaps that we have, uh, as I alluded to, uh, one of the uh, main knowledge gaps that we have currently uh, in dealing with uh, wildland urban interface fires is that uh, we don't have a physics-based representation of how uh, these fires go from the intersection of the wildland to the communities and how they spread. Um, uh, this transition uh, to the community is called uh, urban conflagration. Uh, so if we can invest uh, in studies that uh, uh, can uh, uh, improve our understanding of the dynamics and the physics uh, uh, for this process, uh, we can implement that in models and improve our forecasting capabilities for the communities. Uh, the other uh, area that we can do uh, improvement, and we are doing improvement in San Jose State University, is to uh, provide physics-based representation for one of the mechanisms of wildfire spread called fire branch showers. These are the generation uh, and transport of tiny embers uh, that are uh, still uh, burning. Uh, and land uh, and accumulate uh, far out of the main fire front, they ignite another fire which we call it spot fires. Uh, this is a process uh, that is arguably the most uh, complex and uh, fastest uh, um, uh, mechanism of fire spread. And uh, um, there has been some improvements, but uh, we need to uh, uh, do uh, more uh, studies on how we can uh, come up with uh, uh, physics-based representation of this process in our operational models. Uh, the uh, complexity of this process and also the computational cost has been uh, the primary uh, deterrence for us to consider in our operations. Also, we need to uh, invest in uh, uh, experimental and observational campaigns at flame scales, uh, such that uh, we can observe uh, the evolution of fire from the single ignition point to a larger uh, scale uh, flame topologies, uh, as well as the interactions with the boundary layer, uh, and um, uh, basically evolving to becoming uh, large weather systems. Uh, these are uh, the main things that I can uh, um, uh, elaborate on. Uh, okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and as we've heard from you, responding to wildfires is complex and critical equipment and personnel must be moved to fires so that they can be brought under control before they grow. Mr. Goler, can you expand on the considerations that must be made when responding to fire detections and do you utilize any NOAA products when managing wildfire response efforts? Yes, we do. We 
typically utilize the, the information that they provide regarding weather systems approaching the fire. We uh, depend on the National Weather Service to let us know when, say for instance, any, any thunderstorms any, uh, that might be in the area are collapsing or building that would impact our fire operations. So there's, there's, a, there's two, two differences. One's the initial attack efforts that we have those typically we use National Weather Service products and information either prior to or immediately during a wildfire as we transition into extended attack where a fire lasts for several days to several weeks. Then we become more dependent on some of the day-to-day, hour-by-hour products that they can provide us on an incident to be able to not only our strategic operations but our, our tactical operations. And those are critical for firefighter and public safety. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. We now go to the gentlelady and acting ranking member from Oregon. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank Chair Lucas and ranking member Lofgren for holding this hearing today. And thank you to the panelists for being here. Um, you know, this is a really important hearing, especially for my state of Oregon. Um, wildfire risk is a key concern of many of my constituents in the 6th District. And I remember the fires of 2020. Um, the Labor Day wildfires, I remember having my go bag, learning very quickly, and I don't live in the Wooey. I was in the Portland suburbs, and we all had our go bags, and we were ready to go, but we weren't sure where, because that's how bad this was impacting the entire state. You know, it was one of the most destructive on record, resulted in at least 11 deaths, over a million acres burned, and the destruction of thousands of homes. And of course, the Western United States has always had wildfire season, but climate change induced weather impacts like droughts, heat domes are intensifying them and fires um, and the so-called season is expanding. I, you know, I looked yesterday and I think we had 22 wildfires burning in the state of Oregon right now, burning thousands of acres. I don't know what it is today. So before I dive into questions, I'd also note, and I think a few of my colleagues have also touched on this, that you know, wildfires don't just impact the areas where they're burning, right? We see the um, effects of Canada's wildfire smoke travels far and wide and can endanger cardiovascular systems of pe people who are vulnerable. So my first question, is, so essentially this is not just a Western states issue as we've all heard today. My first question is for Dr. Tahiti. In your testimony, you outlined the importance of fire physics for developing accurate wildfire models. Can you expand on your work integrating fire physics into models and identify where scientists' understanding of the subject might be lacking? Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, Specifically, my work uh, relates uh, to the uh, phenomenon called fire branch hours. Uh, uh, we have been uh, studying their generation, uh, their transport, and uh, now uh, spot uh, ignition uh, and uh, trying to implement them in our operational models. Uh, improving this process and represent physics-based representation of this process in our operational models uh, really help us to understand uh, the contribution of this phenomenon in the actual rate of a spread. Uh, you know, fire uh, usually as uh, being uh, perceived by public is uh, like a wall of flame that goes through the uh, combustibles, uh, but uh, these uh, particles that land ahead of that wall or that fire front uh, play an important role in the dispersion or the propagation of the fire in the community. So we have been trying to improve that part and at least uh, uh, provide a physics-based representation in our uh, uh, model um, specifically, the uh, areas of improvements, uh, um, as I uh, mentioned, uh, we c if we can improve the quality resolution uh, and uh, frequency of the data layers for these models, uh, that can really help uh, to see better forecasts uh, in the short term. And in the long term, uh, we need to really invest on uh, better observations at flame scale uh, using uh, multispectral uh, sensors, um, remote sensing satellites, uh, uh, to really observe the fire behavior at that uh, scales. And uh, the knowledge that we get from those observations and as well as the experimental campaign can, uh, can be incorporated into the future or the next generation of fire models that we have. Thank you. Um, that's really helpful. Mr. Goler, as you know, responding to wildfires is a complex undertaking, and, per, and I think you've touched on this a bit. Personnel and equipment must be moved rapidly to fires to bring them under control. Can you talk through the considerations that you must make when responding to fire detection? 
some of the some of the issues that we face uh, responding to when when a fire is detected in in particular if we are transporting equipment across state lines we do need some help in regards to being able to rapidly move uh, in particular state and federal equipment across state lines without having to go through the honors process of receiving permits to be able to do that and that does limit us on on response especially in those interagency interstate deployments the the fire detection part of it, it for initial attack it, to to have that advanced knowledge of where the worst and the most probable uh, occurrence of fires will happen is critical for us to pre-position equipment and resources aircraft equipment personnel to make those aggressive and uh, rapid initial attacks keep the fire small to prevent those large scale incidents from occurring. Thank you, thank you all so much. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. We now go to the gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, thank Chair Lucas and Ranking Member Lofgren and our witnesses for being here today. As I know my colleagues have highlighted this morning, Wildfires and wildfire smoke impact communities and economies in every corner of the nation. And they will only worsen, putting our communities at more danger if we do not address the threat of a climate change, of climate change with the uh, urgency required. Earlier this summer, the communities that I represent in New York's capital region experienced some of the worst air quality days in history due to smoke from the ongoing Canadian wildfires. And make no mistake, this was not a one-time event. My district is fortunate to have state-of-the-art weather research at the University at Albany, which houses the New York State Messinet. It's a program that has a network of 126 observing stations across the state and 17 Doppler LIDAR sites that are critical for monitoring air quality and smoke. Last year, the university released a study using Messinet data from 21 and 22 noting the ways that wildfire smoke from the western United States was already impacting air quality across our nation, uh, reaching as far as the East Coast. So Mr. Uh, Goler, how can Mesonet data be used to track and respond to wildfires and wildfire smoke? Well, for, for to, to use the Mesonet data, it, especially as we, if, you know, Looking at initial attack, for example, initial attack wildfires, using the Mesonet data would allow us to prioritize which fires might be uh, addressed first. As we see where they occur and looking at the data that is generated through a Mesonet, it shows us what the, the weather system is uh, doing at a particular time, where the most impactful temperature, winds, and humidity and uh, are occurring, and that would allow us to do some prioritization of uh, resources and where they would most be uh, efficient in utilizing that. For tracking smoke, I'm not sure if the Mesonet does that or not. I think that we would have to use some other modeling and other systems. National Weather Service would be key in that to address where the smoke is located, what the movements are. Um, you know, we, we do have a number of airsheds across the United States, Oklahoma 7, and I can't address how many others, what other states have, but we do know through our air quality organizations where, this, where the smoke will be moving, and then what we would need to do in advance of that to warn the public and, and make the most appropriate, or take the most appropriate actions uh, prior to that occur, uh, impacting the areas. Thank you, and are there any challenges or limitations to using Mesonet data for these purposes? And how might a Mesonet program be strengthened and better prepared to address those challenges? I think having more sites would be great. Uh, having the ability to uh, sample other data, we, we do use Mesonet not only for the, just the basic fire data, but we also have a program called OK Fire. It's another uh, kind of works off the backbone of the, the Mesonet. Not sure if New York uses this or not, since they do have, a, you mentioned the Mesonet there. But OK Fire also has the fuel moistures, it has some of our energy release component data, uh, burning index, a number of other products that are critical to fire managers for not only prescribed burning, but also for fire response. Thank you. And Mr. Goller, can you speak more broadly to the role that smoke management typically plays 
while responding to a wildfire or carrying out a prescribed burn? How can we optimize these processes to mitigate harmful smoke in communities nearby and farther away? I'll just specifically address the prescribed burning aspect of that, wildfire smoke uh, being it's a, an unplanned ignition, and we do have those issues in far as uh, ad addressing that. That becomes a little more complicated because it's something that we are responding to and not being proactive for. And so using the uh, Mesnet products and planning for prescribed burning, we can utilize the, the weather data that's generated from the, the, from the Mesonet stations and also the National Weather Service forecast offices to look at what the best days are for prescribed burning to limit smoke management impacts. Most states do have voluntary smoke management guidelines. We try to live by those in order to keep those from becoming mandatory. And by utilizing the weather information from National Weather Service, NOAA, and our Mesonet stations, we can do that to limit those impacts when we have the, uh, we don't want to have exceedances that are identified by our state air quality organizations and EPA, because once we uh, begin to have those exceedances, then the, the likelihood of our air quality regulations becoming mandatory become more real. So. We want to do everything we can on prescribed burns to limit the smoke impacts to communities, values at risk, uh, as we, we do those activities, which, as you can imagine, becomes more and more difficult as our um, weather systems change, as we have drier and drier fuels and, and more fuel to burn. It becomes a little more challenging to effectively prescribe burn and not have smoke management issues. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I had questions for Mr. Tahiti that I'll get to the committee subcommittee, and um, with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Georgia who's been patiently waiting. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is actually a, a fun topic for me because my dad was a uh, special investigator for the forest fires uh, and, and timber thefts, and so I, I remember growing up literally watching the retardant uh, drop pictures uh, of big buckets held up from helicopters being dropped on fires, and, and knowing the unpredictable nature of both the start of forest fires and how you control them with the crews. Um, with all the challenges that we have right now, I'm actually really excited about your technology. Uh, I, I'm really interested to hear um, how you've used something that can actually save us money, save us time, and more effectively fight forest fires. I mean, what, what could be bad about any of those things? Um, the one concern I have is, is how we're managing this from a political side aspect uh, and making sure that we get out of your way in order to execute what you're going to do to help us fight forest fires, which is uh, coming back to the FAA and, and how we're monitoring and how we might get in your way. What kind of things do we as Congress need to eliminate as like antiquated rules, regulations, things that would get in the way of you being effective with your new technologies? Um, I think streamlining the use of advanced drone operations uh, you know, it's really necessary to deploy these technologies. You know, they're deployed kind of in a uh, research basis mostly now, um, but widespread deployment is possible. You know, we could have one of these hives placed at every mason net node, for instance, um, but that's not possible under the current regulations. Um, there really needs to be advancement there. Um, the limitation is not really the technology at this point. It actually is the regulations. Um, and so, the, you know, progress is needed there to get this technology out and benefiting the U.S. public. As far as you know, since you'd be more ready on this than myself, which I'm changing here today, right now, as we're talking, is there any movement right now from Congress to make that uh, effectively happen, to get the regulation out of the way? I think there is movement in the FAA reauthorization bill. Perfect. Um, to bring more, bring more parties to the table um, to help the FAA move that forward. Hopefully that will be a great bipartisan uh, effort as we move forward to do something good for the nation. Thank you. With that, I yield. Gentleman yields back. We now go to the gentleman from Illinois. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Acting Chairman, um, and uh, <laughs> to all of our witnesses. So uh, I, I just got back a couple days ago from a, a CODEL up to Alaska talking about impacts of climate change up there. And um, as you might imagine, a lot of focus on permafrost melt and what happens to methane releases. But we, we got into this really interesting conversation with folks from NASA and permafrost researchers who said that what they've found is that the, it, in addition to the methane risk, or maybe in lieu of the methane risk, they've observed that when you get on the regular fire cycle, so you know, in the before times, before the climate was so hot, 
the fire would come through, it would essentially burn up the forest litter that had been deposited since the last fire cycle. But as the fires are coming more frequently and you've got fuel that's on the ground, you've lost some of the protections of the canopy to slow down the fire, they're now, you're, they're now seeing that you burn all the way down into the soils and release you know, hundreds or thousands of years of soiled so soil carbon, which of course raises all sorts of concerns about agricultural solutions to ameliorate climate change. Um, I've now told you everything I know about the topic. <laughs> so, so if you think I sound smart, don't ask me any more follow-up questions. Um, but I, I guess I'd like to start with Mr. Goler. Is that, and I saw you nodding, but is it, do I have the basic facts of that right and the risk? Are you familiar with that phenomenon? Well, what, what I was nodding on is the, is the phenomena that uh, we see, you know, really anywhere in the country during uh, the course of a year and as we transition into a drought, the amount of fuel that will be burned during a wildfire. In some cases, as you, as you mentioned, when we have adequate soil moisture and we have uh, occasional rainfall, we may only burn one part of the fuel complex on the ground, but as we transition into drought, no matter where it is in the United States, we can burn the fuel all the way down to the soil surface, which releases more carbon, and then also it, it becomes more particulate matter into the atmosphere, and it becomes much more difficult to control. Those cases... And, and, just, and just to be clear, what they were saying is not just down to the soil surface, but all the way down to the mineral layer well, it, and exhausting the, the, the carbon that's locked it, in the soil. And that will depend on where you are in the United States. In, in Alaska, okay. North Carolina, some of the, the coastal areas where we have... There's three different types of fires. There's... Uh, surface fire, there's uh, crown fire, and then there's ground fire. Ground fire is where it does actually burn below the surface of the soil, you know, burns below the soil surface. In, the, in those cases in Alaska and North Carolina where they have peat bogs and, and uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of the, um, uh, the, the peat and other types of organic material that is below the soil surface, that will burn, and then there, there, there goes your release. In, in many parts of the country, we don't have that. We just have the fuel laying on the surface, and that's what go, where, it, where it basic, the fire basically stops. Okay. Well, if, if I, I, I think it sounds like I got most of it right, but I'll, you know, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I guess what I'm wondering is if, if we want to make sure that, the, that we keep as much of that carbon that's locked up in the soil consistently locked up, then do we have, and maybe this is a question for Dr. Tohidi, do we have, do we have enough sort of geospatial precision in our fire maps that we can say, okay, this particular region is at risk of these deeper fires and we should maybe take, take more precautions in this area, anticipate something's coming and sort of prioritize resources where the fires are gonna be particularly intense and particularly, uh, I'm not sure what the word is I'm looking for, L likely to reverse centuries of, of carbon storage in soils. Thank you for the question. Um, we uh, definitely can improve on the resolution of these data layers. Uh, you know, currently, um, uh, from uh, what I'm aware of, uh, uh, the highest resolution that we get from uh, the fuel layers, and that includes Alaska, uh, two uh, is uh, 30 meters by 30 meters. And you can imagine uh, the, uh, there's a lot can, that can happen uh, in a 30 meter by 30 meter area. Uh, so increasing the resolution of these data layers uh, can improve the current state of the forecasts that we have. I'm not aware of uh, 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 the work that we can identify the peatlands uh, that uh, will undergo uh, uh, peatland fires. Uh, but that's a, a very important uh, type of fire that we, uh, we need to consider because these uh, peatland fires, they burn for months and months, and their suppression is extremely difficult. Okay. And we don't want to get into uh, that situation. So preventive actions uh, are the best. Uh, okay, well, I'm, I'm out of time, but if, if, if any of the witnesses have specific thoughts on areas we should be prioritizing research funding or otherwise that might address that, I'd welcome them uh, for the record. Uh, thank you very much. Yield back. I thank the gentleman, and for the record, I want to thank our witnesses for their testimony and let you know, pursuant committee rules, the, the record will remain open for 10 days for additional comments, written questions, and of course, your various answers that you may want to put in further for the record. With that, the committee stands adjourned.